I'm sure that the heavenly chorus must be Filipino. It just would seem the, the natural thing to be. Now again, I ask you to, to bear with me as I um, try to have some sort of a voice today. The, the good thing is, I'm still able to preach. The, the possible good news for you is that you might have a really short sermon. The bad news is I've got about two hours worth of material. <clears throat> so we'll see how it goes. To, to keep with international festival mindset, I've also decided to preach today in my native tongue. If you have trouble keeping up, I believe this is recorded. You can watch it and use Google Translate to figure out what I say at a later stage. <laughs> I am, however, going to ask you to bow your heads with me as I just have another word of prayer. And this I will do in my native tongue. Liefdevolle Vader in die hemel, ek wil vir jy vraag om vasblief nou saam met my te wees. Gees blief my die rechte woorde en help my stem om oor te dra en mag die heilige gees vertaal waar het nodig is. En ek bid dit in jy naam. Amen. <coughs> I would have really liked to have done that in more of a base. But um, yeah. Somebody posted on Facebook this week, Welcome to Texas. Man, if this is the courtesy you show everybody, <laughs> at least the warmth of the congregation makes up for how I feel in my chest and my, my throat. But we've been in the series on stepping up, songs of ascent, going up to Jerusalem, going up to the temple, up to God, up to God's throne, His Shekinah glory. And we have looked at how we try to step up and overcome the challenges that we face in this world. Ironically, I will be doing that as I preach too. But to have that positive twist. Now, one of the things that I've tried to make sure you understand as I preach here at Stonehill is that I try to keep it real. In this sense, I'm not going to preach sermons that colleagues of mine in other denominations in Houston in mega churches might preach you know the kind where you smile I'm not gonna mention names it's always in TV and pretty much his sermons can be summarized in Jesus loves me I'm okay you're okay give me all your money go home okay and I say that tongue-in-cheek but it's amazing how when you listen to these sermons, the majority of these sermons are all about just be happy. Jesus loves you. It's okay. But it's not okay because life isn't always about chocolates and roses. Life is difficult. I mean, as I'm listening to Bo share this morning about going to Cambodia, you guys are not going to have it easy. Sorry to you to paint that grim, grim picture. God is opening doors, but you're going to have to count your pennies. It is not easy going on missions. You have to have support of the congregations. By the way, he didn't ask me to do, but if you want to support, grab him after church. They need every penny they can get because they're going into where you and I wish we could go, but don't. But it's not easy packing up. I know how difficult it was for me to sell everything I had and come to the States with two suitcases, let everything else behind. It's difficult. And then to come here and not have no family, have no possessions, it is difficult. And then to while you're having this difficulty to still become sick, to feel alone, maybe even lose a job, 
It's not easy. And there are several of you here who don't have jobs, who are desperately trying to find jobs. And when peer pastors come up and smile, it's okay, Jesus loves you. It doesn't cut it for some of us. Because just the fact that Jesus loves me doesn't mean that I now have food on my plate. Something still has to happen. Life is rough. And so I've tried to share with you a more realistic approach on life and not to sugarcoat what it means to be a Christian. It used to bug me when I started coming back into the church and pastors would just tell me, it doesn't matter what you're going through, just surrender to Jesus, everything's going to be okay. No, it's not. The big picture, maybe. But right here, right now, I'm suffering. When you lose a child, for goodness sakes, how is it going to be okay? 17 years down the line and I'm hurting. Losing a child is not easy. I am, however, here to tell you today that in looking at stepping up, you can still find joy. So I am going to sound a little bit more like a TV preacher today. But I also want to tell you that despite me trying to keep you real, the way my wife hates, every time she has a dream, I'm like, well, have you considered this? <laughs> like, you always bring me down to earth. Well, I'm just trying to be realistic. But every once in a while, I have to tell her, well, that is a good idea. And I think that could work. It's not going to be easy, but we can make it work. Well, in the same thing with our spiritual experiences, I'm not here to just keep you real all the time. I'm also here to give you hope saying, there is good things that happen to people. There is good things that happen when we accept Christ. I'm not just here to tell you you're going to suffer through life as a Christian. One of the first things I want to do when I make it to heaven is to take a surfboard out in the sea of glass. I don't know how it's going to work because if it's a sea of glass, it's not going to be waves. But I also know that a God who loves me is not going to give me a sea with no waves. So maybe I'll surf on a hoverboard like back to the future or something. I don't know. But I know that when I get to heaven, I want to do all the things we just dream about now. The things my daughter looks at the Bible stories and go like, I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to run up to a lion and just give him a bear hug. I want to walk up to the biggest hill I can find and roll down the hill as fast as I can and know that I'm not going to get dizzy at the bottom, but it's okay if my jeans stains because I'm in heaven. I want to go up and have some fun. Sometimes we do get the things we want. Sometimes we do get the blessings we pray for. We teach our children, pray, please, Lord, not the way I want, but let your will be done. But God says, I am here to tell you that sometimes you can get the things that you want. It's not all bad. Now, when you're down in the valley, down in the dumps, I know it doesn't necessarily feel like there's an upside. I know it doesn't always necessarily feel that it's going to be positive and things are going to work out because I am down. But as I always say, when you're so low down, you have to look up to see the bottom. Do that. Look up. Because that is going to come your way. Sometimes our joy shouldn't just be joy. I've shared with you a few times the way we worship. We come to church and we're all happy. And I see some of you smiling and you try to be the best possible Christians in the way you smile. Even when things funny happen up here. <laughs> Sorry, when did you become an English aristocrat? I say, that's funny. <laughs> Sometimes we should just smile and go, wow, that's awesome. Sometimes we should just be so happy that it is silly happy. Sometimes you just have to be who you are and let the blessings wash over you and be giddy with joy. The mere fact that you are in God's presence today, none of you should sit looking at me like, What's he talking about? The fact that you're in God's house today, you should have a smile that people will actually be wondering. I wonder what they did before they walked into this building. You should be so filled with joy because you are in God's presence. 
As a young guy, I used to love going down to the beach, surfing, body surfing. One of the things I enjoy probably more than getting on a surfboard itself is actually body surfing. And we would actually have a whole mindset and skill set. We would have gloves for body surfing, flippers for body surfing. And I tell you, I would hit those waves in Durban and I would, it was powerful. 15, 18 foot swells and it's just you on that water and you just like, yeah, feel like Superman just hitting those waves and you are riding it and those waves would break and it would be foam everywhere and you'd get up and it's like, ah! whoa! It's just so awesome. I would scream just because it was awesome. I'm not going to enjoy nature and get up out of that water clean myself off and go, <laughs> I say, that was a fun wave. <laughs> Everybody else like, yo, dude, that was gnarly. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah! When you come to God's house, the fact that he died for you, the fact that he gave you a second chance, you have a chance at a new life, an eternal life. You have a chance to roll down those hills in heaven. You have a chance to walk through the pearly gates. You have a chance to look God in the face. How can you just go, "Mm, that's nice. What? Awesome. Yes. This is better than seeing a celebrity on the street or encountering a celebrity at the airport when girls see a guy walking down the airport. Oh, Justin Bieber, oh my God. This is Jesus we're talking about. But yet we don't want to give action to that excitement knowing that we are talking about our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, our Salvation. Good things happen to us. I remember when I asked Michelle to marry me. Wow. She didn't know at first, or she didn't really realize I actually proposed. (laughs) Our plans got canceled. We sat on a chair and I read her poetry. And I ended off with, will you marry me, my love? I'm not going to recite the whole poem because I won't make it. But she went, wait, what? Are you serious? And that's when I opened the box. Well, let's just say that kiss, it was a divine kiss. There was good stuff in that kiss. When they say there's chemistry, man, I felt like I was gonna short circuit. It was divine. Good stuff. Good things happen to us. I don't deserve her. But God said, hey, even guys like you deserve good stuff. Thank you, sweetheart. So I read Psalms 126. As I look at the scripture we're focusing on today, Psalms 126. I'm going to be reading the whole psalm. I was contemplating looking at it at three, four different translations because the wording in sum just really says it more than what I'm looking at today. It says in verse 1, When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. Some translations say here, we were drunk with joy. Now, I hate to admit it, but I had a rough teenage life. So let's just say, I understand what it's like to be drunk with joy. That's all I'm going to say. Praise God, I'm no longer the person I used to be. That's the next thing I'll say. But to see someone so happy that they can hardly control themselves, they can't even walk straight because I'm going back home. 
The first time I made it back to South Africa after several years here in the States, I remember walking through the airport and I was, I literally think people thought I was drunk because I was looking at everything. <gasps> they speak my language. <laughs> they speak my language. <gasps> oh, I love that shop. I haven't, been, I haven't tasted that. <gasps> I'm home. There's just something about coming home and that is what it's all about when we are going to make it to heaven. Home, where we belong. I carry two passports. And even this morning, I had to cheer for two flags. I even wear two flags on my lapel today, South Africa and America, because I'm a citizen of both. But this is only temporary residence. Because my true citizenship is in a different world. And as beautiful as this country is, it is nothing compared to where I belong. It is nothing compared to where you and I are going to have a parade of nations where every person will be represented. Such a wonderful psalm. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. And the other nation said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with harvest. It's a wonderful psalm. And the key to unlocking the psalm, to understanding how it relates to you and to me, is to understand that this psalm is really revolving around two characters two people or character types the first is the exile returning home again i understand no matter where i go no matter how much i love it i love to go to the east far east that is and i tell you every time i come back from hong kong japan as much as i feel like i should have been born there i just feel my inner being is Eastern, <laughs> I love the cultures. No matter what I experience and how majestic what I see might be, there is nothing that beats that plane touching down on home soil. To come home, open the door and see your wife. To see your daughter, I'm home. No matter how struggling and how difficult it is that you are going through to be able to walk in and see family home. No matter what we are enduring now, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how many times you think that you should give up, that you should just walk away from it, no matter what, nothing will beat walking through those gates and looking into the eyes of someone that looks back at you with loving, tender kindness, saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. I cannot wait to experience that. I cannot wait to see His face. The other character in the poem speaks about a weeping sower. He has a difficult. The weeping sower and the happy rejoicing returning exile. And we'll look at both of them in here in just a little bit. First, I want us to look at the concept of this returning exile. That joy. You know, most of our memories is what triggers joy we get happy when we remember things i had a pleasure a while back to to go and and watch a rugby game at the current world cup with some south africans from this congregation i can't begin to express to you the joy that i felt in my heart being able to speak about my country my people my sports with people that know exactly what I'm talking about. Joy. Excitement. 
but we are triggered by what we remember I'm not home now I'm not experiencing my cooking now some of you will tonight but not now but thinking back of memories is what brings us that joy just talking about kissing Michelle has got me all giddy right now she's not up here kissing me now unless you want no okay but thinking back about those memories is what really triggers us but here is the thing when we look at life we shouldn't have to rely on memories of things that have happened in the past we also have to look at how we can enjoy life right now in the here and now in Jesus name I'm not talking about just instant gratification but looking at what he has blessed us with right now right now preaching is one of the most difficult things I have done in a while because I'm struggling here but praise God I can still do it praise God I can still see you nodding and knowing that you're still understanding me somehow praise God joy should be more than a memory it should be something that we happens in the now and when it happens in the now I should be aware enough to know that it is happening now so many times things happen in our life and we don't see it as joy now my daughter will come and interrupt me busy working by just jumping on my lap and hugging me and telling me how much she loves me and how I'm the best daddy in the whole world well thank you girl I appreciate it but I'm busy working no joy right now it's happening right now I should treasure it and enjoy it and be joyful right now God is raining down blessings on us and we are so busy trying to find what we think are the blessings that we are not experiencing his blessings right now I remember the birth of Lauren it was a very surreal experience going to that hospital room the doctor handing her to me after I cut the umbilical cord and telling me I need to go and wait in the adjacent room while they finish up with Michelle and I remember walking with this little girl Is she mine and I walked looking at her sitting down and I was disciplining myself for not feeling a connection for not feeling ownership and I was wondering why am I not emotional here I see all these videos and friends tell me that that was just they couldn't control themselves and I'm looking at this little pink thing well she wasn't little but this pink thing in a hoodie no skull cap eyes still glued shut and I'm holding her and I'm thinking what well, she's she's actually quite ugly she's she's pink and wrinkly at least she's healthy and I'm trying to process what's experienced what I'm going through here and then she opened her eyes When our eyes connected, it was all done. I wish I controlled myself as much as I am now. I couldn't control myself. I was sobbing because suddenly I realized this is my daughter, this is mine. that emotions the feelings that I experienced that joy I cannot begin to describe to you she has brought so much healing into my life 
to go and finally make it home. To know that my daughter has come home. My daughter. <laughs> it felt, sounds funny saying it. My daughter has come home where she belongs. To see my wife sit on the bed with her and hold her, just glowing, just radiant, just... It's my family. To enjoy it now. A child has been born. A child had come home. I can't begin to tell you how many times I would walk into the bathroom very calmly, shut the door, went to the mirror. <laughs> I'm a dad. Get myself together, splash some water on my face, and walk out like, Phew, don't go in there for a while. I didn't even use the restroom. I just wanted to do a happy dance. Because I had a wife that I loved. I had a daughter that just changed everything I ever thought, thought and felt I knew about life. Joy. It is important to, in the now, in the here, to sometimes be silly and filled with joy about the blessings that God is showing you. You guys ever seen the show, I Shouldn't Be Alive? No? Man. The show messes with your head. It's a show filmed about people that found themselves hiking the Appalachian Trail and five days in, slipped and fell several hundred feet down or rolled down and now was stuck. And there's no way out, both legs broken. Snow's coming down. West Virginia winters, which I've experienced, it's cold. And they know they're going to die. Okay? The show is about reenacting what had happened. Now, you can know by the title of the show, you know that, well, they didn't die. Because, well, I shouldn't be alive. But obviously I am, so they did survive. But the show shows these scenarios. And as you know, they're stuck in this environment and not ever once does the helicopter see them the first time. It's ironic. I think nature conspires to say, well, we'll pretend not to see them. We'll just fly by. So we make the rescue so much more worthwhile when we come around the second time. Because it seems the chopper always finds them the second time. Because the first time, well, they look up and... Oh, the heart's broken. The helicopter didn't see me. I know I'm going to die. Oh my goodness, I'm thinking about my family. And then choo, 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 choo. the best sound ever, if you know you're going to die, is the sound of the rotors of the helicopter landing to pick you up. But here's the thing. When you watch the show, they like to play five minutes into what has happened and they say, stop, rewind, go back to the beginning. Let's recap. This is what they've done up until this point. Then move on two minutes, stop, rewind. Let's go back to the beginning. Tell the whole story again, add another five minutes, stop, rewind. By this stage, you are praying for a helicopter to come and rescue you from the show. And they keep on going back until you're like, I need something to happen here. Uh, commercial break. All right, so commercial break is done. Oh, just in case you missed it, Let's go back to the beginning. Okay, so the helicopter comes down. Woo! You enjoy it. You celebrate with them. And then you enjoy and relish because you are so hooked in the show right now to see them express their joy at being rescued. There's nothing better than seeing someone who came this close to death walk away knowing that they are safe. That joy. Most of the people they interview will give all the credit and the glory to God for rescuing them. And I praise God they're willing to acknowledge that on te television. But they are giddy. You see them just jumping and hugging everybody and anybody. Anybody in the helicopter, when they get out on the other side, whoever they can see. I'm alive. I shouldn't be, but I am. I, have, I love you. I don't know who you are. It doesn't matter, I'm alive. How often do we have that mindset?
Because let's face it, you and I don't deserve to be alive today. If the wages of sin is death, none of us should have passed six or seven years of age. And yet we are still here. How often do you go around thanking people for being around you? Purely because you're still alive. That's the joy of the returning exile, coming home, because we will experience that when we get home. I tell you, when I walk through those pearly gates, I'm going to hug everybody I can get my hands on. You want me to start now? We will, we'll, when I get to the door, you and me, give you a big hug. I love watching soldiers come home. You know, I could, whenever I go on Facebook and there's another video of a, of a dad surprising his kid at a football game or these soldiers that have been deployed for so long just absolutely blows my mind and t turns me into just a big soft teddy bear. And some years back, after the first major crisis in the Gulf, a group of Marines came back and was televised. And all the family were in this military hangar just waiting for the Marines to arrive. Wives and the children were just, they were besides themselves, holding up banners. I love you, here I am, welcome back. Daddy, come and meet your son. All kinds of banners up. And one of the, the base commanders came in and made an announcement that the men were still about an hour out that they would be here in about an hour. So just stay tight, you know, just sorry for the delay, but it's happening. Well, the band was there, they're still playing Stars and Stripes Forever. And I tell you, since I've become an American, that just gets me too. Um, I'm probably more patriotic as an American than most Americans. Because man, what I had to go through to become a citizen, man. Anyways. About 15 minutes before they're supposed to arrive, the hangar doors open up and the Marines march in ahead of schedule. And to see those women, knowing that it's still going to be 15 minutes, suddenly look up and see, there's my man. Kids just running, tears and bodily fluids dripping from nostrils, no care. They've come home and they run. Women knocking the guys over, jumping on top of them. Kids, three-way hugs, what, what we like to call in our house family hugs, where everybody is just hugging. And watching this on TV is just like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to make this. And you get all excited to see this all happen. And you hear this one word ring out time and time again. Daddy, 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 daddy. Man. Some parents have never even met their children. That joy to finally meet Junior. To pick up his little princess for the first time. To understand that I'm home. That's the story of the returning exiles. Family going through a frenzy of joy. But you see, but the reality is that not all of us get to experience that joy because there were some Marines that came back looking for their wives, but all they could see was their fathers. Because while they were deployed, their wives decided to not be there for them anymore. They came home expecting to be knocked over with hugs and kisses. They came home expected to be loved and jumped on and just hugged. But they met with a father who does not quite know to show his son that he loves him, but yet feels so sorry for him. I'm glad I can see you come home, son, but I'm sorry that she's not here. And I'm sorry that your friends who you thought were going to come home with you didn't make it home with you. But they are now casualties of this war. 
See, the exiles have returned. They've discovered that after 70 years, their home has now been overgrown. Their home has been destroyed. It's been 70 years of desolation. Finally, some of them have cleared things up a little bit and they're trying to get it together. You need to understand that a million of them left in exile. And after 70 years, only about 50,000 made it back. Out of that million, the majority of them had either died or become so involved in Babylon that they wanted to rather stay in Babylon. 50,000 out of a million is all that made it home. We've currently got 18.7 million Adventists in the world, so they tell us. I like to differ because I know what membership records look like. <laughs> but I wonder how many of us will actually make it home. How many of us are living our lives in such a way that when Jesus comes, we will actually be ready to go home? Or would it be better for us to stay in Babylon? Safer, it's what we've grown accustomed to. Or how many of us will just simply be casualties of war? There is the Marine who's returning home with those he was hoping to see not there. Everybody else is jumping and shouting for joy and suddenly his sweet homecoming is turning so tragic he wishes he could get on a plane and go back to where he just came from. Because there he had his team. Well, actually, that is even gone. Why? What do I have left? And so we experience the character of the weeping sower right here in this marine because he is seeing everybody else's joy. And their joy is making his pain even worse. Have you ever experienced that? When people rejoicing around you makes you feel worse because you got the short end of the stick. I remember my first Christmas in the U.S. Having left everything and everybody I know behind, I end up getting stuck in a double wide trailer home with four more feet of snow around me in the mountains of West Virginia. I can't get anywhere. I don't own a car. I'm a missionary in the middle of nowhere Appalachia. Everybody else is away on home leave. It is Christmas, and the only thing on TV is the Christmas story. That in itself will make you miss people you never even met. And having to watch that movie and not have your family with you, and now starting to miss your family who have passed on from this world, as well as those who are still alive but on different continents, and everybody else is singing songs and drinking eggnog, whatever it is they do to celebrate their holidays, and you are stuck in a creaky old bed in a double white trailer home with an old TV, I felt sorry for myself. And I suddenly understood why the, the phrase was coined, bah humbug. I didn't want anybody to come and celebrate Christmas anywhere near me. If I saw an elf or a Santa, I was going to kick him. Their joy now became my pain because I was stuck and alone. Well, it's a dumb example, but I hope you get what I'm trying to say. So what do you do when you become this weeping sower, when you experience this pain, when you understand things are not going the way you are hoping to? I go back to our scripture, verse 4. The Lord restores our fortunes as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with a harvest. Now, this is extremely important for us to take notice of here. Because things are not always going to go well for you. I don't care what any television preacher told you or what I've told you in the past. Coming to God is not going to be all good. You are going to have rough times. You are going to wonder if you made the right decision because things are not coming together. See, but the weeping sower here, no matter how much he's crying, no matter how much he's suffering, he is still carrying his bag of seed. He could have disposed of it, 
but he understands that for him to be able to move forward, he still needs to do what is expected of him to do. He needs to sow his seed so that he has a harvest. Somehow, he understands that his future is determined not by his weeping, but by the sowing of those seeds. See, no matter how rough things are, you need to keep the process going. It needs to be a positive process too. You can't find a job, no matter how difficult it is, keep sending out resumes. Don't just give up. Keep on trying. You go to Whataburger and you say, I want to be a part of Texas heritage. I'm willing to flip burgers. Please just help me stay alive. You got to keep sowing. You got to keep on the positive process because it will determine your future, not your weeping, not you feeling sorry for yourself. What else will determine your future is that there is a circle to life. And if God is in that circle, it will come full circle. So there is this drunkenness of joy, this frenzy of joy that is experienced. But this weeping sower says, I am not going to give up. I'm going to keep on sowing through my tears. Even if I can't see where I'm sowing, I'm going to sow. I know some will feel on the hard ground. Some of them will feel on the rocks. Some of it will fall amongst the weeds. But I'm going to keep on sowing because some will actually go where it's supposed to go. And I will have somewhat of a harvest. So what then happens? The weeping sower finally comes back and he understands that he actually reaped more than he thought he was going to. And now the weeping sower could sometimes be even more giddy than the returning exile because his blessings have superseded his weeping and the joy that others have experienced around him. But he did not give up. He kept on sowing. You know, the Italians have a wonderful saying. The situation is desperate, but not serious. The situation is desperate, but not serious. So what does it mean? It means you might be going through hell, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. But that is not the biggest problem. It could be even worse. I just need to know that I am ready to meet my Maker. I will get through this. This is not the end of me. This is not the end of my story. So the pilgrims going up to Zion, they are singing the song. We are drunk with joy. We walked as though this was a dream. Some of us, we were just filled with tears. But yet, despite the tears, we went and did what we had to do. And we now have come back with joy, filled with joy. As a church, I very much encourage you to feel the joy. Experience the joy. We need to do more than just speak about joy. You know, we as Adventists, we like to sit around a table and talk about a bunch of stuff. And then come back a month later to discuss what we discussed the last time we were discussing stuff. Instead of saying, what can we actually do? We love to have meetings. It drives me bonkers. What are we actually doing? We have to enjoy the here and now. So is there thing, are there things in your life that you can enjoy now? Are there things that you can experience that will bless you even although you're going through a rough patch? Michelle and I went to Kirby Lane last week. <clears throat> if you haven't been there, great food. Went to the one in Round Rock. Now I have this habit and Michelle keeps on telling me I'm wrong. And I am. But whenever I go into a store and they scan anything and there's a problem with the scan, I always tell them it's because it's supposed to be for free. So give it to me for free. Uh, we can't do that. Management, you know. So I always try to joke about free stuff. And so this waitress comes up and she's very friendly and we have a good chat. And she's like, how are you guys doing? And we're like, we're good, we're good. How about you? No, I'm great, great. Well, I ended up saying, well, I think I will be even better if this meal was free and she laughed and she says well I'm sure you would be 
And we went on. We ordered. We had a great time, great food. And then she walked and she put the check down on our table. So I thought, well, since we've been joking, I'm going to joke some more. And I said, well, I thought this meal was going to be free. She goes, well, I still took care of you. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Until I opened up the check and I looked at the check. Zero dollars due. And I didn't know what to say. And I looked at Michelle and I said, no, no. You know, you read about these kind of things on Facebook. <laughs> I've never experienced it. And I said, I can't take this right now. She goes, listen, just you guys have been incredible customers. You've just been so friendly to me. Just you treated me so well. And when you joke like that, I was like, well, it's the least I can do to say thank you. I said, I've been in your shoes. I've worked tables. You can't afford to do this. I said, please take whatever we would have paid for this meal and it's yours. And then I put on a few extra dollars. Actually, Michelle was a little, maybe I put on a few extra dollars, too much. <laughs> then she was shocked. And so we all went on with our day ecstatic. I ended up paying far more for that meal than I originally would have. <laughs> but I was so happy, so filled with joy that someone who could not afford that was willing to do it to make my life a little better, to bring joy to me, that I had to try and bring joy to her. I wish I could sign over a thousand dollars like some of these other guys do. I'm a pastor, it's no way possible. <laughs> I could hook her up with her good retirement plan, it's out of this world. Okay, five of you got that joke. Anyways, here's the bottom line. There are small joys in this world that we need to tap into. Look at a child in this congregation. See them smile. Enjoy it. I don't know how many kids we've seen smile and 16 years later, you wish they would just be innocent and smile. Enjoy the smiles now. Enjoy good food. For goodness sakes, come out tonight and enjoy good food. By the way, I made some South African fudge. It's so good, it'll slap your brains out. Just, just come and try it. But enjoy the small things in life. Enjoy a good cold drink on a typical Texas day. Relax. Enjoy big breaks. Have you ever gotten that job that you've been looking for for so long? Have you ever signed that contract you've been trying to sign for so long? Have you ever met the right girl? No, you haven't. I married her. Sometimes we do get those good things. Enjoy it. Don't just feel entitled to it. Enjoy it. You know what? Life is fundamentally good. Even if CNN and Fox makes you understand that at any given moment we are entering the fifth and sixth world wars. I don't know how many world wars they think we are about to enter. Life is still good. We can worship here today without secret service police officers listening to us, trying to shut us down. We still have freedom to say what we want. We can even complain about the presidential candidates and not worry, like in Zimbabwe, where someone was in prison for telling a joke about the president just this week. We have so much still going for us. Be happy. Be filled with joy. Ultimately, sow the seed that you've been given to sow. When things are bad, keep on going. Ultimately, we are going to go home. And each and every one of us will rejoice. 
I promise you, if I see you walking through those pearly gates like you're at a funeral, I will kick you through those gates. You should be jumping like you have just won a gazillion dollars because you've actually got something far better. You should hop, skip, do somersault, do whatever you can, but be happy. Stop being so sad. You are sons and daughters of God. Will you let God cheer you up this week? Do you think that you can let yourself just be humble enough to let God put a smile on your face as you walk weeping? Will you please continue to carry that bag of seed and sow and start scattering them all over the place, understanding that life still is good? You could have been without a bag of seed. As we finish up with a praise team singing, I'm going to invite each and every one of you to get up to your feet and to sing as though you are actually joyful today. I want you to sing this closing song as though this is your personal gift to God today for saying, thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for giving me an opportunity. Seize the moment. Sing and praise for Jesus. Amen.